Attention, attention, calling all the cannibalism girlies to this video. Hi! What do all these movies and TV shows have in common with one another? They all ate. And not in a four plus four kind of way. And not in like a me way, you know? They literally all ate each other. I have wanted to make this video for actually the longest time which is such a strange thing to say like, I have wanted to make a video about cannibalism for the longest time, but it's true. I love cannibalism. I'm just kidding. I'm vegan. Plus I literally promised the sponsor of today's video that I would condemn cannibalism, which I do. I swear to God, I do. Anyway, speaking of which, let's talk about something a little bit uplifting and wholesome for a hot second. Today's sponsor. Thank you so much, Kara, for collaborating with me on today's video. I've been taking care of for a few months now and I'm so happy that I started, especially now that it's summer, it's so important for me that I have the energy that it takes to do the things that I wanted do this summer. And with Care Of, I feel like I totally have that covered. I love that Care Of is growing and evolving with me because as my goals change and as my needs change, I can easily just retake the quiz on Care Of's website. Care Of is a subscription service that ships high quality personalized vitamins, supplements, and powders to your door every month. Made from good for you, clean ingredients that are backed by the latest science and research so you can feel good about what you're putting into your body. It can be so troubling and overwhelming to try and pick out what vitamins you need to be taking. So Care Of's quiz takes all the guesswork out of building your routine. The quick quiz asks you questions about your diet, lifestyle, and health goals, recommending the right vitamins and supplements for your specific needs and goals. Look how cute and personalized little packets are, and they're sustainable. They're made of plant-based film, making them compostable. Take care of this quiz and see what supplements and vitamins they recommend for you. You can click the link below or scan the QR code on the screen. Use my code Nicole Raffi for 50% off your first order with care of. That is a steal. Thank you, Kara, for sponsoring today's video. Previously, I had watched Dahmer, the show, for a video on this channel. The video is called something along the lines of true crime fans deserve jail time, something silly like that. And I also watched Fresh in my free time, not knowing much about it, except that it had to do with cannibalism. And then Bones and All was making a breakthrough. I ate him right the fuck up, and it felt fucking great. And then Yellow Jackets quickly became my favorite TV show ever. Serious, who took a shit? <laughs> In the pee bucket. Does it look like it's a girl poo or, you know, a boy one? So I never thought I'd be so excited to make a video about cannibalism, but this has literally been months in the making. So anyway, sit down, prepare for some spoilers, and maybe don't grab a snack. Like, you can. I know that I could not snack while watching any of these shows or movies, but anyway. I truly believe, quote me now, if I could invest money into this, then I would. I truly, genuinely believe that we're gonna see so many more cannibalism shows and movies in the next few years. I'm making a jump and a theory, so quote me in your next school papers, but anyway. I really do believe that cannibalism movies and shows are having such a huge spike right now and are so successful because it is a direct reaction to the pandemic. Okay, let's backpedal, give some history. If I paid as much money as I did for my college degree and dealt with shitty ass roommates and the Temple University mumps outbreak, I feel like I have to use my media studies and production degree for something. It's literally only fair. In order to understand the background and the themes behind cannibalism movies, we also need to understand zombie and superhero movies. Because oftentimes both of those genres are used as an allegory. Personally, I could not give less of a fuck about superhero movies or zombie movies. Sorry, except The Last of Us because of Pedro Pascal. <laughs> My very, very first boyfriend, we were together for a really long time. It was a week and a half. He had nothing to talk to me about except The Walking Dead and the fact that I had a gluten sensitivity. So anyway, talking about The Walking Dead or zombie shows in general just puts me in like a really bad headspace. So sorry if I'm starting to like not act like myself or something. Superhero movies, Marvel, zombie movies had a huge boom in success after 9-11. I'm talking about 9-11 right now, Clemmy. not now. I'm not making a 9-11 joke, I'm dead serious. I'm dead ass. Even in college, I learned that these movies were so popularized because they were response and reaction to America's recent biggest terrorist attack. Not only were they scary and entertaining, but they had themes of racism, political anxieties, and ideas of conformity. And some people agree that America turned to superheroes to rewrite that day so that it ended as one where nobody had to die. It was emotionally healing and therapizing to watch people or groups with nearly infinite power doing whatever possible to keep their homeland safe. And the itches of America's little baby bald eagle brain, you know? The deep psychological needs for reassurance and vengeance. It's the most American thing ever. Um, 
Sorry, that just exited me. People loved it so much and needed it so bad during that time that it became such a successful franchise. Had 9-11 never happened, we probably wouldn't have the success of superhero movies like we do today. And we also would not have Fifty Shades of Grey, but that's a conversation for a different time. And zombie movies also became so popular during the early 2000s. But I feel like if anything, after COVID, zombie stuff is the last thing people want to see right now because it is getting a little bit too close to home, which is why I think The Last of Us did an incredible job because it could have flopped so easily because I think people were burnt out from that kind of content, but they truly did their best with taking advantage of nostalgia because so many people were in love with the game, but also harbored so many new people's attention in a time where people don't want to consume content about pandemics anymore. But they made it work very well. Nowadays, people don't want to be watching on TV straight up exactly what they are going through. We want escapism that we can relate to bits and pieces of. Why we like Sims. That's why I love the Sims. Like I can make my Sim kind of look like me, but then I can also go and make my Sim woohoo. It's escapism and relating to small bits of it. But in our free time on television and in movies, we want escapism, something that we can relate to bits and pieces of, and like a sex scene or two, you know? We want terrifying, we want gross, we want shock value a lot of times, and we also want Timothy Chalamet, which is why I truly believe that cannibalism movies are a direct reaction to COVID, and I don't know if it would be as successful in this time or even be happening had COVID never happened. Cannibalism is the most taboo topic ever. Look at my mouth. It's the most taboo topic ever. Have we ever truly been in a more taboo or tumultuous time as we are right now? People love drama and taboo-ness. That's why you clicked on this video. As much as people love conspiracy theories, which I've also talked about on this channel. Do you know what adrenochrome is? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to make it sound like John Mulaney in that moment. Hey, does anybody here know what adrenochrome is? Where are my adrenochrome girlies at? The adrenochrome conspiracy, a bizarre theory with anti-Semitic roots, posits that Satan worshiping global and Hollywood elites run a massive child trafficking ring to drain their blood and harvest the chemical adrenochrome to stay young it has been embraced by subscribers of the QAnon and Pizzagate conspiracy movements. The most normal people ever will just get a little bit too emotionally vulnerable and in a bad headspace, especially in a time like the pandemic, and start believing that the elites are drinking baby blood. And I know what it looks like. I know I look like the biggest cover-up of all time. Like, oh my God, this bitch is always talking about Doja Cat conspiracy theories and adrenochrome and how it's not real. Oh my God, she's trying to cover something up. And you're right. They paid me so much money to cover it all up. Have we ever considered that maybe I too have been delusional and have been very lucky and thankful that I have been able to grow into, I don't know, like a healthier headspace and also, uh, grow critical thinking skills and have common sense and not believe everything that is on the internet. I literally had to stop supporting one of my favorite local businesses during the pandemic because they could not stop posting about Adrenochrome, Pizzagate, Trump. They were QAnoners. Like, okay, cool. Now I don't even feel comfortable getting a balayage from this fucking place. Anyway, I think that most people are drawn to taboo and wild topics the more stress we are under as a society. As a society. A healthy and busy individual does not know what Adrenochrome is. Is, okay. A healthy and busy individual also does not believe reptilians run the U.S. government, all right? A healthy and busy individual also does not have delusions or paranoia or very high anxiety. Which then brings me to the question, is anybody right now of healthy and sound mind? Most psychologists will tell you, after the pandemic, not really. We as a collective, all different generations and age groups are all looking for escapism right now. We're seeking shock value and entertainment. When our lives felt like it was truly becoming contagion the movie, while dealing with political turmoil, environmental disaster, racial divide, police brutality, all while losing loved ones around us, whether that literally be due to death from like COVID or police brutality, or losing loved ones to loving conspiracy theories and QAnon more. Yeah, we want to watch content that feels so insane and like it'll never happen to us. Uh, so gay. We want to watch something that we can see themes of problems ourselves are going through, but something so crazy like cannibalism that we'll never experience it. Right. Be a personal thing. It's definitely a personal thing. If I were to die and you eating me, my friends, I would want it to be like my friends and family. I don't know about strangers. If them eating me would mean saving them like in the wild, want them to do it and no one seems to receive that very well when i say that and i thought that was like a very sweet thing of me to to give permission for but anyway let's start with the movie fresh 
a movie that makes bisexual Twitter say, I don't know why I want more. Starring Daisy Edgar Jones and Sebastian Stan. It's about a normal, sexy guy next door, which is already the first thing that's unrealistic because that does not really happen. He claims he's a plastic surgeon and he's super spoony and will like take you home and cook for you. And then he wants to take you to a sexy ass mid-century modern home, which is like the biggest green flag ever. Like I too could easily get abducted in that kind of situation, absolutely. And then right smack dab in the middle of the movie, he's like, JK, and he poisons you. And he's like, I'm just kidding. I'm not a plastic surgeon. I sell human meat to the 1% of the 1%. I make so much money off of it. I'm sexy and I'm scary and Ooh, I'm Sebastian Stan. Ah! Fresh uses cannibalism itself as a tool to show many different themes throughout the movie, such as meat as a metaphor for women, consumerism, contemporary dating, female camaraderie. Fresh is an allegory for many things Edgar Jones previously told Rolling Stones. You could say it's an allegory for the commodification of females in society, and also it sort of explores the aspects of dating in a contemporary world. We almost shop for each other, you know, like you would for a jumper. There's also the balance of being open to meeting new people but also knowing there's a risk involved. I think another appeal to cannibalism movies and shows is that it's the security blanket that we know that we're safe. When I was in college, I took this class about the end of the world. That was so good for my mental health. And I had to watch this movie called The Day After. And then shortly after I started anti-anxiety medication because I was so fucking scared of nuclear war. Anyway, shortly after I found out I had OCD. Anyway, I digress. And it fucked with me so much because I already had anxiety about nuclear war happening. Like I knew that was a plausible thing that could happen. Yeah, nuclear war could happen, Clemmy. Not in your lifetime. Nuclear war is not the most unrealistic thing in the world to ever happen. It's a lot of people's fear, which is why there are so many end of the world movies out there. I mean, literally Oppenheimer is coming out like in a couple days. However, cannibalism, I don't know anyone who's ever eaten somebody. I, at least I don't think. Have you ever eaten someone? Yeah. Sometimes cats eat their babies when they're born because they don't think that they'll survive. Cannibalism is not my number one concern or a massive fear of mine, nor is it that big of a fear of most people except clumps. However, watching Fresh, I was like, oh my God, yeah, it is a huge fear of a lot of women that they'll get kidnapped by their Tinder date and literally uh, drugged and taken advantage of. That is something super plausible and something that a lot of us can relate to. Okay. But is it a big fear of mine that he's literally going to cut my ass off and sell it to the rich elite? Not that much, not, not that huge of a worry. There's also like not that much to cut off in the first place. So anyway, I remember being introduced to this movie because of TikTok and it was absolutely popping off and I heard it was about cannibalism and I was like, that really intrigues me because I don't know the last time I watched a movie about cannibalism. I don't know, maybe ever. And it was sexy. I was like, oh my God, two sexy people. And they kept using this like one clip of them dancing. I was like, oh my God, this is so sexy. How can this be scary? I think that this movie was marketed perfectly and kind of the start of something new within the cannibalism world. Dr. Schultzman notes that the film highlights a kind of repulsive consumerism the kind that perhaps leads people with too much money to buy a social media platform for billions of dollars just to destroy it. Talking to you, Musk. These people have so much money that when they want something, they want everything, he says. It might not even be great to eat someone, but it doesn't matter. They have a few billion, they'll find out, which is creepy. But the very, 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 very rich are pretty creepy. Cannibalism runs parallel to extreme wealth and privilege within a capitalist system in which wealth often comes at the expense and exploitation of other less privileged humans. Now, while researching a lot about cannibalism, something I never thought I'd say, there's also a sexual aspect to it at times where it's, you know, a kink to some and then the thought of cannibalism and yada, yada, yada and army hammer. I didn't really dive too deep into that because that's not really what I'm talking about in this video. However, I do definitely think that there might be a sexual aspect to cannibalism that makes these movies so popular right now. And I think some of these movies and shows that I'm talking about definitely benefit off of that, and some of them not as much. Director Mimi Cave says that she was attracted to the script as a part of the Me Too conversation. I've never had a fascination with cannibalism more than the average ew and gross curiosity, but there was something about the symbolism held within the context of the story for me, she tells Rolling Stone, relating specifically to women's bodies. I immediately saw so many layers of visual metaphor in my mind. And speaking of symbolism, let's talk about Bones and All with Timmy Chalamet and Taylor Russell, which has so much fucking symbolism. And I took the time to watch this movie the other day because it was the only cannibalism movie from the last couple of years that was like hot and popping that I have not seen. And oh my God, I understand the appeal. 
I like Timothy Chalamet. It's a lot. Like, it definitely added to my very grueling nightmares that I already have. But, like, it was like a Mia Goth movie if she ate her lover. Anyway, once again, I think this movie does an incredible job at showing how cannibalism is oftentimes just a tool for important themes. Like the movie itself could stand without the idea of cannibalism. It totally could. Do I think it'd be as big of a success? No. Could the whole love story and trauma and guilt be told through this story without the eating people part? Yes. Bones and All is actually a book originally, and Camille DeAngelis tells Rolling Stone that she set out to tackle consumerism and self-loathing. Going vegan, she says, gave her a new perspective on why these monster narratives are so compelling. With zombies, everyone just thinks it's about overconsumption in general, mindless consumption. I'm thinking more specifically about who we consume. Which definitely, as a vegan, I have my own opinions on cannibalism movies and such. I don't eat meat. I haven't eaten meat in about six years now and i could do a whole video about that and i know not everyone is as interested but one of the main reasons that i went vegan was for animal rights my opinion i truly did not feel okay or good morally me eating the body of something else that did not give me consent to be consuming it and after sitting with that for a long time after just kind of being used to eating meat my whole 17 years of life. It was kind of shifting and changing my whole mentality and everything that I had been taught prior to that. And so for me, this idea of mindless consumption and who we consume and the self-loathing that we experience because of that, or I guess in this case, the characters are experiencing that, I can relate to that. Although I don't think that that was originally maybe the themes that they were going for. But one of the scariest characters within Bones and All is not Marin or Lee, the people who must consume meat to live, like human, human meat. They literally call themselves eaters. The way that a human literally needs water to survive, that's how they need human flesh. And the way that I need a little kiss on the forehead every single morning in order to keep going every single day in life. Those are not the scariest people. It's actually the cop who chooses to eat human meat out of curiosity and not necessity. It's an obvious nod to the ongoing epidemic of police corruption. He's curious and he can, and so he does. The screenwriter also wants it to be known that this movie isn't about what love should look like, more so about why guilt and shame led to the main character accepting his death. And like I said, obviously these movies and shows could be made without the cannibalism within it and they could still tell their story. Do I think it'd be as artistic? Probably not as much. However, I do think that Dahmer the drama biography was not really created with the intention of some underlying theme or lesson that it was trying to teach because it's a true story with real victims and family who is still very much alive. They were not notified or paid whatsoever for their contribution to the multi-million dollar Netflix success. Their story was literally exploited and they got nothing out of it except having to relive it because it was literally everywhere. I already made a whole video about my opinion on the show Dahmer and how I think that a lot of true crime content, not all, but a lot, is just exploitation made with very poor taste. Ryan Murphy, who co-created Dahmer, said, what are the rules now? Should we never do a movie about a tyrant? in response to heavy criticism pointing out in a cast roundtable that the show isn't meant to be lingering voyeuristic look at one man's horrible acts, but an interrogation of an increasingly dark world. I think it came out at a time where people are looking to put their anxieties into something to express anxiety, or maybe to watch something that's more anxious than the world that they're experiencing. I also think that since COVID, people are very interested in examining pieces that talk about mental health, and all of the characters, every one of you, have those scenes. Now, Murphy and I have the same opinion that people are looking to watch something that's more anxious than they are. More anxious than the world that they themselves are experiencing and living in. However, I do think that he totally took advantage of the fact that the world is looking for something like that and has increasing anxiety because of everything that is going on. But he's like, oh yeah, I have the opportunity and the ability to retell a story that's been told so many times um, and let's retell it again to just re-traumatize the whole family. And I think Ryan Murphy did something that's pretty shitty and taking advantage of people who are very desperate for releasing their anxiety and you know the sense of escapism by retelling a story that's been retold so many times and doesn't really need to be retold again and exploiting many families stories and re-traumatizing them um, for the sake of entertainment when this story is not entertaining it's real. And I feel like it is possible to entertain an audience and give a form of escapism uh, without telling a story that isn't yours. And that hasn't been dramatically told over and over and over and over again. 
as the families are literally asking for you to stop. Dahmer's victims were not killed for the sake of our entertainment. I think people are super sensitive about humanizing somebody who's done something so evil. To me, that's a slippery slope. I'm not saying this holds true for every person about a serial killer, but to me, the key to understanding this perversion and the reason to tell these stories is precisely because they are three-dimensional human beings that sometimes act like human beings. The people who do evil in this world as someone who has covered crime usually are not people who act like monsters 24-7. I just don't think that we need a whole Netflix series to realize that. And I think it is possible to do that using fiction. However, another piece that I do really agree with is Dr. Schulzman posits that the Dahmer story took off this year due to distrust, fueled at times by the rampant popularity of true crime content. There is a paranoia right now in the United States that we don't really know people the way we think we know people, he says, and our fascination with Dahmer speaks to that. And what does that say about us? That we can't trust the food from a neighbor, that we can't guarantee that our dates won't eat us, or our friends and teammates won't feast on our flesh. If you put on a paranoid cloak, it occurs to you that anyone could do anything to you. We're trusting people to be good. Sheldon says, the bottom line is most of the time people are good. And then the big question is, why are they good? Which is why I think that Yellow Jackets, which I'm so excited to talk about. I'm so happy that finally someone brought this up. I have been wanting to talk about Yellow Jackets for the longest time, not the fucking idol. But anyway, Yellow Jackets is easily one of the best shows out there and is heavily, heavily underrated. Its ability to use cannibalism to shock the viewer, but also make you empathetic to understand why it has become a last option for these girls. It's incredible. It's beautifully done and written. Essentially, the show is about a girl's high school soccer team that is going to nationals by plane who happen to get in a nasty plane crash. They're stuck in the wilderness for 19 months, and it shows how, as a group, their mental health has been severely affected as time goes on, but also individually, how survivalism can change a person and makes you ask yourself, what is a good person? And are these people good people or bad people, even though they may have done something that is objectively wrong? Everyone should go watch it. I'm convinced that the only reason that it isn't as big as it is is because it's on Showtime. Cannibalism in Yellow Jackets is a commentary on how one's humanity is easily stripped in the face of survival. And the show touches on such important topics like PTSD, addiction, grief, and how what they had to do in the woods to survive wasn't some romanticized badass thing, but truly, truly traumatizing and how it affects them then in the future, uh, present day. Sophie Thatcher, one of my favorite characters on the show who plays Natalie, in an interview with ID says, I don't know how to say this without sounding psycho, but on the show, we kind of normalize it, it meaning cannibalism. We go into these scenes thinking about our character's mentality and it's fucking defeating and terrible, but it doesn't feel evil. Sophie has her own theories as to why cannibal tales like Yellow Jackets and Bones and all may be resonating with people right now. Everyone is striving for something as dark as possible as if our world isn't already dark. So showrunner Jonathan Lisko says Yellow Jackets is not a show about if cannibalism, it's about why cannibalism and how cannibalism. I've truly never seen a show portray PTSD any better than this. And I really wish it had more recognition. Um, and it's really interesting to hear everyone's theories and how many people really sympathize with others. Because when I started the show, I was like, no fucking way I'm gonna empathize with cannibals. And then you watch the show and you're like, I don't know what I would do. I literally don't know. Are these bad people? Are these good people? I don't know. Anyone's gonna survive in the wilderness. It's going to be a team that's figuring out how to win. And yet they don't use the best parts of themselves. They use the worst parts of themselves. That to me seems like an important message. Like we're pretty good at species when we work together, but we seem not to be doing that so well lately. So let's talk about my predictions. I personally think that we're gonna see so many more cannibalism movies and TV shows in the coming years because clearly it's a success and people are interested. It's disgusting, it's shocking, it's successful. And Army Hammer is dying to come back into the spotlight. I think he's literally sharing timeshares on an island right now. So any human eating another human is by definition the greatest taboo. You can't get mad at a zombie. It's like getting mad at a crocodile. Cannibals, they're sentient. They're eating with gusto or because they need to. Not only are we so desensitized to blood and gore and violence on television, I think it adds something completely new when you get all of that gore and blood and now you involve food with it. I think a lot of people thought that the menu was going to take that direction, that it was going to be a movie about cannibalism, which it ends up not being. It's an amazing movie nonetheless. I love the menu, but they definitely benefited off the idea that it might have something to do with cannibalism. There's also so much saturation in media, YouTube, TikTok, shows, movies, 
there's so much of everything. Um, like we're not lacking in literally anything. There's regularly more than 400 scripted shows per year, plus plenty of movies. So we're running out of taboos to be taboo. I can't even imagine what the next taboo may be in like 20 years time. I genuinely have no idea. But I do know that right now, still even in 2023, cannibalism causes a knee-jerk reaction. It's an instant hook and gets people to want to watch it. Like I said about Fresh, it's one of the reasons why I was like, oh, I'll watch Fresh. And I don't usually take recommended movies or TV shows. I'm like very weird about what TV shows and movies I watch. Um, I always worry that I'm going to waste my time. And so I never want to just trust someone blindly but cannibalism was enough to like draw me in if you hear somebody get stabbed to death then it doesn't make the newspapers but if you hear someone killed and consume somebody then everyone's hearing about it on the news every generation finds cannibalism afresh it's always functioned as a symbol but what exactly it symbolizes changes with the times today it's frequently filtered through the themes of female empowerment and exploitation but always with the lingering fear that regardless of the popular slogan really it's the rich who eat us i think that's so interesting this has been such a fun interesting thing to look into and i'm curious in the next decade what is cannibalism in film going to symbolize next i can see maybe it could be something about people's rights being taken away as we're seeing a lot today women's rights getting stripped gay rights getting stripped i could see how maybe that could be of symbolism in the next 10 years or something i think it's also going to continue to be commentaries on capitalism. Cannibalism is about consumption and it's about burning up from the inside in order to exist. Burnout is essentially overconsuming yourself, your own energy, your own will to survive, your sleep schedule, your eating schedule, your body. Now a theory that a lot of conspiracy theorists have is that all these cannibalism shows and movies are being released to try and get us to be normalized with the idea of cannibalism like happening in reality. And I don't think so. I don't think that's the case at all. Maybe this isn't the best example, but how when clown movies were all the rage and as a marketing thing, people took pictures of random clowns out in public. That was all like a marketing scheme. Most of the time those clowns weren't real clowns or like murderous clowns. They were just clowns that were dressing up because it was coming out soon. I don't think people are gonna suddenly resort to cannibalism because it quite literally goes against every norm in our culture. So cannibalism is actually very widespread in nature. Like I talked about, some animals will eat their young if they feel like they won't survive or they need it for nutrients. There's medicinal cannibalism where just about every part of the human body was used to cure every type of illness or psychological malady. And it lasted right up until the 20th century. It was, it was even in the Merck Index, the big pharmacological encyclopedia and it just disappeared from its history books. They just erased it. And nowadays, some people still practice medicinal cannibalism, people who consume their placentas after giving birth. That's the remnants of medicinal cannibalism. It's fallen into alternative medicine under the idea that if you consume your placenta, you are replacing the hormones that might have been lost after birth. And that's not something that's widespread worldwide nowadays. It's mostly just Americans. Also, it's a common thought that we're biologically driven to be repulsed by the idea of cannibalism. But Long Island University professor of biology, Bill Shutt, author of the acclaimed book, Cannibalism, A Perfectly Natural History, says, no, it is not biological. Um, culture is king. Cannibalism tended to be so widespread throughout nature. Hundreds of thousands of species from invertebrates to apes that consume their young for reason that we know nothing about until recently. Scientists figured out that there's all kinds of different reasons why cannibalism exists in nature, like parental care or unpredictable environmental conditions or sexual selection. For example, if you're a codfish and lay five million eggs, it's not like it's Tony and Tina over there. You're looking at the equivalent of raisins. They're nutritious. There's no danger from consuming them. Probably more fish are cannibals than not. Culturally, once you get into humans, we're the ones that decide whether it's okay to consume grandma after she dies because it's paying homage to her in some way or if that's disgusting and you think that she needs to be buried. And in Western culture from the time of the Greeks and then passed on to the Romans and everyone else, there was this idea that cannibalism was the worst thing you could do. It ties to the idea of the other. If you're a good ancient Greek, you're not eating bodies, but the other guys do, so they're not even human. A lot of people jumped on that bandwagon in the East. It became arguably the number one Western taboo. If other cultures were practicing cannibalism, when the Westerners showed up, they insisted this behavior was not going to cut it. So this professor doesn't think that it's something evolutionary or that there's a gene that prevents us from cannibalism. It's just that it is cultural, which I think makes it even more interesting that this is more of a cultural taboo than this kind of like biological taboo that is innate within all of us. I am so happy that I made this video. I feel like researching for this video has been so extremely fun for me and watching all the movies and TV shows. I'm in no way like dying to watch the next cannibalism movie because it definitely makes me queasy and uncomfortable, but I am excited to see what movie that features cannibalism next 
what symbolism is behind it because that really interests me. And I think I'll be thinking about each cannibalism movie a little bit more critically now as long as it is not a biographical drama specifically about Jeffrey Dahmer. It feels like coming out against cannibalism is the most 2023 thing ever, but I feel like it does need to be said. I do not condone cannibalism at all. But I think as a person who has been vegan for the last six years, what I consume being a really big part of my ethics and morals and learning more about the history of it, how it's more culturally ingrained within us versus biologically ingrained in us. It makes me have a lot of questions. Definitely none of those questions are how human meat tastes. I literally do not give a shit. Anyway, go watch Yellow Jackets. It's an incredible show and deserves all the love and more. I literally cannot wait for season three. I'm gonna go now. Make sure that you leave this video a like because it helps me out so much. Also, leave a comment if you have watched any of these movies or shows or if you have read any books about cannibalism because I saw a few that seemed kind of interesting. Don't know if I'm ready to dive into that yet, but I'd like to hear if any of you guys have read any of those books if you know what I'm talking about. Make sure you subscribe if you want to be nasty if not, you're disgusting. Also, make sure you have your bold notifications on so you know every single time I post or else you are gross. Very bold of me to say on a video about cannibalism. If you want to follow me on my other social media, Instagram, Twitter, Depop, Spotify, Threads, it's at Nicole Raffi. And if you want to follow me on my TikToks at Nikki Nasty. I'm going to go now and make myself some food, which is wild that I have an appetite after this, but I've done a lot of research for this video, okay? I'm immune. Thank you. Love you. Goodbye. Yeah, it'll do it sometime.